this fourth and final part of the talk concerning the rights of carers under the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act 2014 concerns commonly occurring problems that many carers experience, including problems that have arisen out of the current COVID-19 emergency. COVID-19 has obviously created huge problems for families, but also for local authorities and the health service in delivering support to disabled people and carers in need. And that problem is largely to do, of course, with social distancing and avoiding transmission of the virus. An act was passed in 2020 giving um, local authorities in England and Wales quite wide powers to suspend their statutory duties under the social care legislation. Now, those powers have not been brought into force. And therefore, when we're discussing uh, the obligations um, on local authorities, to a large extent, the, the, that act is not relevant. Accompanying the legislation, however, there's been a lot of guidance that is valuable, and that is going to the heart of how can local authorities continue to provide support without putting people at risk and spreading the virus. And I list on this slide uh, some of the guidance that's been issued. Uh, it's easily obtainable through Googling. What I think is at the heart of all the guidance is the fact that local authorities have got to continue to use all their best endeavours to deliver services, to provide support. And where there are problems, they have got to be seen to be acting flexibly. And so the 2020 guidance, adult social services during the COVID pandemic guidance, says effectively that, that authorities should continue to do everything they can do to continue meeting their existing duties under the legislation. And that the fundamental principles that underpin that legislation remain unmodified. And that's the duty to prevent, if at all possible, and to intervene early to support people and to prevent uh, their condition deteriorating. And to ensure that people are given voice and control, that they are heard, they're listening, to, listened to, and that the local authority adopt the assumption in the legislation that they're best place to judge their well-being. Now, uh, English guidance was issued concerning an ethical framework for adult social care, and the Welsh government has specifically endorsed that. And as I've already said, one of the key elements to responding to the COVID emergency is flexibility. And that's heavily emphasized in this guidance. It says that this principle is defined as being responsive, able and willing to adapt when faced with changed or new circumstances. It is vital that this principle is applied to the health and social care workforce and wider sectors to facilitate agile and collaborative working. So if families are in difficulty and they make a suggestion that support can be provided in a particular way, then local authorities have got to seize that opportunity rather than to say, well, we don't normally do this or we don't normally do that. The answer to that is this is not a normal situation and you're going to have to think and act differently. And so the guidance talks to me about being flexible when care and support is provided, being imaginative in the use of direct payments. So this will obviously emphasize the importance of carrying over funds from week to week because there may be supply side difficulties, there may be um, care assistance and support that isn't available because people are isolating or they're simply unable to attend that week, but then using that money to pay perhaps for twice as much support the following week. 
And also the point that there may be family members within the bubble, within the household, who are willing to provide the care and then local authorities can use their flexibilities to agree that the direct payment be used to pay the family member. There's no law to say that can't be done. Indeed, the guidance says um, that where necessary, it should be done. And this is particularly important. Flexibility is particularly important in relation to visiting. So there have been some court cases concerning elderly people in care homes or younger disabled people who are very disorientated and distressed by the fact that their relatives are no longer visiting them. And in those situations, the court's cases have stressed the idea of being imaginative. So of course, uh, relatives can um, wave through windows or have conversations that way. Uh, and in other cases, uh, people with learning disabilities can be trained to use iPads and other tablets uh, so that they could communicate by Zoom and other methods with their families. One of the concerns that a number of carers organizations have voiced in Wales is the problem that will happen when the restrictions are being relaxed. A number of packages have been reduced or stopped purely because um, it's been proved impossible to deliver that support. And it has been stated by a number of local authorities to families that when the relaxation occurs, they won't immediately reinstate those packages, but they would first have to undertake a review or a reassessment. Now, I think legally that must be wrong. Uh, if support is assessed as needed and it's in proving impossible to deliver that, then local authorities must demonstrate flexibility but they must do everything they can to deliver that support. And obviously when a relaxation occurs of the uh, visiting restrictions or the social distancing restrictions, for example, they must then immediately reinstate that service because the impediment, the barrier has been removed. So to summarize, the key legal points that need to be made if a local authority is suggesting that a pet care package will not be, in rein, be reinstated without a reassessment or review are as follows. Firstly, that a need continues until the authority has evidence to show that it does not. So in the absence of evidence that the need no longer exists, that need must be met. And if that need has not been met because of problems with delivery, then the local authority must find another way of delivering that support. Or if the rules on social distancing are relaxed, then the support must be reinstated immediately until such time as the local authority has cogent evidence that the need has diminished. Another commonly occurring problem that carers experience is where there is conflict between them and the person for whom they care. And this can arise in many ways, but not uncommonly, the problem is that the cared for person is refusing services which are vital for the carer for example, they're refusing to have personal assistance or respite care. And therefore, by doing that, they're denying the carer a break. Legally, these are difficult to resolve. Um, the law doesn't have a magic wand. You have two groups, carers and disabled people with legal rights, and there's a conflict. How do you decide uh, to resolve that? Well, I think that is really only done by good social work practice. Sometimes perhaps having a social worker acting for the disabled person and the carer or 
um, some intermediary. The key point, however, is that local authorities must worry away effectively, um, do everything they can to resolve that conflict. They can't simply walk away and say there's conflict and there's nothing more we can do. The English Care Act makes this obligation explicit that where there is conflict, then the local authority must, so far as it is feasible to do so, find some other way of delivering the support that the carer needs. This isn't made explicit in the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, but clearly this must be a guiding principle of the Welsh legislation as it is for the English. There is some useful guidance in England on this question. It's provided in guidance on the whole family approaches. And it gives the example of an elderly person with dementia who is adamant that she only wants her daughter to care for her. But the daughter is exhausted and at breaking point. And so what it advocates is that the local authority adopt an imaginative approach to work around this issue. And what happened in that case was that the local authority explained to the elderly mother that the daughter needed help with her housework and the daughter needed help with her washing while she was at work. And so the care assistant comes in ostensibly simply to help the carer, the daughter with her day-to-day -day routines. And it's made explicit that it's nothing to do with the daughter's mother. And uh, I think as is predictable after three or four weeks of this happening, the mother becomes used to the carer being in, uh, bonds with the carer, becomes friendly, and then is increasingly willing for the carer to do certain chores uh, and caring roles that the daughter has otherwise done. So it's a question of basically of breaking the ice perhaps by um, some subterfuge, but uh, the outcome of which is that the daughter has a break and the mother has a substitute carer with whom she is comfortable. Another area that, that causes problems relates to the reluctance of public bodies to share information with a carer where the disabled person has lost the capacity to agree to that information sharing. Now, the basic principle of confidentiality is that you shouldn't disclose information that you've received from somebody to another person without their permission. But if you're in a position where the person that has disclosed that information, for instance, information on a file, and they then lost the capacity to agree to the disclosure, then the confidentiality principle is approached in a different way by the law. In those situations, the law says, is it in the disabled person's best interests that that information be shared with somebody else? And if it is, what would be a proportionate way effectively that you would share as only a limited amount of information that is necessary to satisfy the needs of the other person. And there's some very useful guides, I think, issued by the General Medical Council for GPs. So often GPs are asked by a carer about the condition of a disabled person and they're told that that can't be shared because the person the disabled person lacks the capacity to agree to that. But the General Medical Council advice on this says this, it says that it would be reasonable to assume that patients would want those closest to them to be kept informed of their general condition on, and prognosis if they've lost capacity. And so I think that principle must apply also to social work records and other records. If the social worker, if the doctor has no evidence that the disabled person before they lost capacity has some problem 
is has, has demonstrated that they are reluctant for a particular person to have that information, then if they lose capacity, then those nearest and dearest and closest to them should, as a matter of principle, be provided with relevant information so that they can understand the person's general condition and prognosis. That's the end of the talk on carers and the social services and well-being act, and I hope it's been useful. What follows is uh, a brief slide, a um, brief series of slides with general resources, where you can get information on the legislation, on the regulations, on the codes of practice, and also a, a slide concerning a website at uh, my website, www.lukeclements.co.uk, which is the Ridian website, which has details of the law in Wales.